Uh, my name is Charlie, Charlie Davies. I'm the CEO and founder uh, of a company, HQ, out of London called Travel Time. Uh, we've got staff across Europe now, but uh, headquartered out of, uh, of London. It's great to be here with you, you all today and just generally at the conference and obviously being in person with everyone. It's so nice to see faces looking back at me and not just a Zoom, I don't know, a, a Zoom uh, waiting room. So we're an API first company. Uh, that really means that as a product, all we produce is APIs, not end-to-end -end solutions. The way that people interact with us is as developers communicating and using our APIs. And we focus on very high performance and scalable mobility APIs, so ability in querying the, the transport networks around us. But obviously, in theme of being at Berlin Buzzwords, here today to talk about search. And the way, most importantly, the, the way the physical world, the world around us, the world that we, that we live in and experience on a day-to-day -day basis, can be used to improve the relevancy of search, the user experience, and the performance of location-based applications. And that performance is not only in the response time, so how quickly those sites can perform, but also in the economic sense, in the conversion and the, the economic models that, the, that they adopt. But I thought it would be a useful place to start today and to actually thinking about, you know, where's location search today? You know, how does it start? Where, where, where do we start? What would we do? And the first element really to any sort of location um, uh, indexing or search or, or, or collating usually starts with geocoding. Now, geocoding is a really easy thing to explain. It takes a human readable address, Berlin, and gives it a, 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 a lat long coordinate in order to you know, put that into a database for, for search. It can be, though, incredibly complex. If any of you have actually worked on geocoding projects, to actually take what is in someone's mind as an address and to put that onto a map in the right area or the right place can be very challenging. That's not specifically what we focus on. We provide geocoding services. Um, <clears throat> and geocoding is a really great start because what it does is it takes a location, and gives it an anchor. It's somewhere to begin. It's somewhere to search from or search to. If we didn't have that ability to begin with, then we wouldn't really have any way of actually searching. And once we've got all of those locations, and they may be the query terms, they may be where locations are in your database, whether that's a business, a property, a job, whatever, whatever it may be, or an advert, we're going to store those inside of an index. We, we, we've, we've heard lots about, <laughs> about those in the past, past 24 hours. But once they're, they're there, the, the query terms that we regularly use to, to query them are kind of static and, and generic. Now, if any of you have used um, Elasticsearch, any of the geo, uh, geo properties around it, this is going to be like uh, teaching you to suck eggs. But just to sort of run through what the three main different ways of doing this are. The first one is a bounding box area. It's the ability to essentially draw uh, a square or a rectangle, four-sided shape, um, to show the results that exist inside of that area. Um, it's mainly used on applications and sites where you're moving um, a visual map around, and there's an ability to update the search as you're moving around. So the, the, uh, the, the waypoints or the icons on that map are going to be automatically updated from the database. The great thing about a bounding box is it's a really, really simple calculation, especially when we treat the world as a completely flat plane. We're just doing the, doing the very simple math of figuring out the top left to the, to the bottom right. We then have the wonderful world of polygons. And I'm allowed to say the wonderful world of polygons because there have been occasions where I've dreamt about nothing else than polygons. Polygons, as a definition, they have to have three points. Uh, if not, it's just a straight line. Um, and they can be used for lots of different things uh, in terms of where searches have happened before. Maybe they're municipalities, like councils or, or city, city regions. They can be much more relevant than a bounding box. You know, you can sort of focus in on a specific geographic area. Um, but they don't scale very well. If anyone has actually tried to use mul uh, complex polygons or even multi-polygons, um, very computationally expensive uh, and slow. And, 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 and slowness is really never a good thing. 
And then uh, there's your friend of mine, the, the searching of distance, something that all of us have used on countless websites time and time again. It's really simple. It's show me everything within one mile, five miles, or 10. Um, it's super easy to understand. And it's always completely accurate in the sense that if you were to draw a straight line from where you're searching to where you're going, it's always going to be the same distance away. Um, yesterday, I heard the expression nearest neighbor way more than I ever have before um, in in, in the audio sense, um, but nearest neighbour to us really very much is the distance actually on the on the sort of physical physical sense of the the world, not just in um, the machine learning sense. So you sort of got these three use cases really: the bounding box that I run through, you know, really good for those visual elements of you know what can I see inside of the area, the view. Maybe it's the mobile uh, real estate view that I'm seeing right there. Polygons used for those municipalities, like I said, could be a borough of London like Camden or Islington, or it could be a city such as Berlin. And also that ability to do draw a circle around and then rank um, the points inside of there by, by distance. All of these can be and have been and will be over and over again used in building models um, that are then executed for query time or for push. So highly complex data sets can be um, manipulated and reduced down to very simple extractions for users to understand in terms of making it relevant to their location. And the really nice thing about all of these, just moving the, the very complex multi-polygons to one side very, very briefly, is that they're all really fast. You know, if you if you execute um, a search for um, distance or, or bounding box, the response time that you're seeing is going to be very, very, very minimal, um, and it scales really well. It scales really, really well. Uh, whether that's in Elastic, Solar, Open Search, um, other databases, obviously uh, available. But performance is incredibly important. Um, not just for the sense if you're sort of a performance junkie like me and you log on and check the benchmarks after the latest deployment the night before and you're just forever seeing those milliseconds drop and drop and drop. They're super important for websites where conversions are king. And a conversion can mean many, many different things to many, many different sites. And if you pull up presentations from different, uh, different applications, they'll call they have the same, same name conversion, but they'll, call, they'll, they'll mean slightly different thing. But you can essentially reduce that down to the idea of taking a user, someone who has just come onto an application or a site, and you've turned them into a consumer. They have, they have, there is a sort of monetary moment, whether that's they've uploaded something, they've registered for something, or they've, or they've bought something. And we know that conversions and performance are intrinsically linked. Um, there's tons of this. Um, in fact, I had to sort of reduce it down to just these, these four points. But there's loads of research out there that shows if your performance is degrading, no matter how well designed or how well how the content in your site is or the, or the products that you're selling, if the performance isn't there, your conversions and the, the economic performance of your site is going to degrade. I think Amazon did the most sort of granular sense of this in you know, reducing for every 100 milliseconds of latency, cost them 1% in sales. You sort of add that up. I mean, we've, you know, when you look at maybe your <laughs> Kibana dashboard and you're seeing all the response times, those, those changes, those fluctuations can mean real things to the performance of your, of your application. So location sort of, in some ways, been stuck. And it's been stuck because the, the pull has been that you know, performance is critical. We can't have any more complexity because if we slow our site down, any more relevancy is going to be destroyed by the, by the performance degradation that we have. So performance, in many ways, has been more crucial than relevancy when you're trying to optimize for the overall conversion of a, of a site. We've, we've defaulted. You know, if you go on any location-based service uh, application today, the majority of them, 99% of them, are going to be doing either a bounding box, a polygon, or a distance-based search. That's, that's pretty much it. The best sort of results that we see in terms of relevancy for the individual, for the user, um, is distance ranked. 
So this one's five miles away, 10 miles away, 20 miles away. It's always right. You know, you're drawing a straight line on a flat plane. So wherever you do that search, and if you repeat that search, it's always going to be the same distance and empirically true, but not exactly very helpful to the user. In fact, it puts a lot of emphasis on the user. They've got to now understand what that all means. Now, I'm not a big audience participation guy, but I thought I'd have some audience participation time. Um, has anyone ever gone to an application, seen a list of results by distance, copy and pasted an address, and then put that into a separate application, like Google Maps or City Map or Remove It or whatever it may be, to try and understand what that location means? Yes. <laughs> For a very brief second there, I thought no one was going to put their hand up, so thank you very much. Um, and that's a really good point, because it really, it takes away that, it, it, it makes the emphasis back on that user to actually understand the results that you're, you're producing. And the whole theme throughout this conference has been how to deliver the most relevant contextual results for that, for that search term at that time instantly. So really naively, um, we thought, what else could we do with location? Um, and I say naively, which I'll get to in just a second, because it, it actually created um, far more work than we ever anticipated. And we started off with this idea that the problem at the moment is that a lot of the location uh, fundamentals on search are driven by that performance and how, how easy, not easy, but how performant it is to do inside of those databases. You know, it's, a, it's an a la carte type situation. You're already using a database. You go to the... Um, to the docu documents, you see the standard polygon uh, bounding box, uh, distance-based search. You use them to then build, build the application. But when you think actually about how people move around, um, the world can look very different to how we actually perceive it on, oh, sorry, how we view it on maps. Now, this is a map from 1914. Uh, and it's an isochronic distance map. Now, the term isochrone sounds really fancy, but all it really means is they are points that are the same time away from a central point uh, instead of distance. So an iso distance is a circle, because all the points of that circle are the same distance away from the center. Isochrone means that all of the, the, the points are the same time away. So here you can see, um, I did try and find one that wasn't London-centric, but failed. Um, this shows the journey time in days, believe it or not, from London in 1914. So over 40 days uh, to reach um, Australia. Um, but you can see here that it's actually just a completely different way of looking at the world. Um, and it actually takes into account how you and I use the world around us. It takes into account what we have to do. You see, the thing is, when it comes to people, us, um, we don't live in boxes. Um, we don't live in circles either, um, and we don't live inside static shapes. You know, we don't just come to the, the boundary of a city or a municipality and go, ooh, um, that's, that's me, I can't, I can't leave, um, unless you have some sort of um, criminal, uh, criminal past maybe, but that's, that's sort of by the by and a bit of an edge case that I don't think we can account for. You see, the, the, the world around us is an extraordinarily complex thing. We, we have built... Um, from the ground up, and a, a very complex ecosystem in which we all inhabit. And there's a huge disconnect at the moment in how we search that world versus how we actually um, live in that world. We have incredibly complex road networks that are dependent on um, traffic, one-way systems, uh, what time of day certain vehicles can go inside of them, depending on various um, city, city logistics. We have the natural world around us as well that stops us moving in those straight lines um, in the sense of there's a river in the way or a peninsula. If you take somewhere, just an example of Australia, if you take somewhere like Sydney and draw a straight line, it has absolutely no relevant meaning to what you can actually do. None of us can fly, um, keep trying, uh, and no, ma no matter how much Red Bull spend on their marketing campaign, still haven't grown wings, still can't fly in a straight line. And then there's also increasingly more complex and useful public transport networks around us as well. And we had this idea 
of would it be possible to actually take all of the examples that I just showed you and put them inside of a, a search engine um, so that we could actually search using the, phys using the physical world around us. Because when you search at the moment, it's an the, the databases have an abstracted view of what the world is. It's essentially a flat plane. We're treating that for query time and perform uh, performance overall. And then we get our results back to us. So we went to uh, the drawing board. Uh, that's the best image I could get, I'm afraid, uh, to, uh, to, to show the drawing board. And actually think to ourselves, well, yeah, how would, we, how would we do this? And naively, we thought that, hey, this must have been solved already. Um, there's loads of mapping services out there. We must be able to collate all these together and then produce a search that essentially reflects how we would use the world around us. Um, it turns out there really isn't. Um, there were some very slow models in the, in the GIS world, so the geospatial world. Um, and what we... What we have resulted in is a, is a system that looks a little bit like this. So at the moment, focusing in on the distance-based search that I was talking about earlier on, you know, the best you can do, whether the user selects it or whether it's a predefined configuration hard-coded into the search query that you're pushing or pulling to users at any one time, is what can I do within you know, one mile, five miles, 10, for example. But what would actually be more interesting if you could say, well, that's 45 minutes by car from central London in the time that you're searching right now. And even more importantly, if you were searching by the tube network in London, this is the area that you could get to. Now, again, this is an isochrone shape. All the points are the same distance, in, sorry, same time away from that central location. And you can see here the natural progression as it follows the tube lines out of central London. And as you get to the stations, you then have less time to walk away, which is why those areas reduce, because you have less time to walk away from the station at that time. And then when you bring in mainline train services, so <clears throat> um, intercity connecting services, the area is less, but you can get much, much further than you could do before. And what we found is that when you're searching by distance, specifically, up to half of the results that you're returning could be irrelevant. Now, if we were doing a natural language processing or query time, and we knew that half of the results that we were displaying were irrelevant, we would probably say that model wasn't very good. If I was searching for blue cars, and 50% of the results I got were red, or I was searching for Italian restaurants, and all I was getting was Indian restaurants, there would be a huge disconnect in the relevancy. But that's exactly what happens on location-based searching today. Up to half of the results can be completely irrelevant because when location is involved, either you're going to travel to it or it's going to travel to you. And in that, we can use the utility that we all, all have is movement and time. And then, more interestingly, is that there could be lots of opportunities that you would miss, that you wouldn't even think of, because they might fit on a fast train line. They might be around a peninsula. Um, and these missed opportunities, um, if you were to include them in a distance-based search, or even actually taking the bounding box of that view that we're seeing right now, the noise just increases even, uh, even higher. The, 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 the irrelevancy is going to... Um, uh, sorry, the relevancy is going to decrease massively. So we found that you know, if we were to search this way, we could you know, double the relevancy of the existing search that is there. Now, you can see that this is a visual representation. So to take this and then compete with the performance of a distance-based search, there was a big disconnect. Um, in fact, when we first produced some of these shapes, it took about two minutes <laughs> to calculate. Um, and our first demonstrations to our first customers were more about making sure they were distracted while the page loaded and then, and then going back to them. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's how I learned to talk so, so quickly. Um, location is really not a static thing either. You know, the, 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 the examples that I showed you there were, you know, just for sort of visual representation. Um, but if you take somewhere like... Uh -huh. New York, between the hours of 6 and 7 p.m. for the public transport network, it's a living, breathing entity. You know, you might miss a train. You might, 
get a faster train and then be able to access a bus. So you can see that when we take into account the real-time, real-life situation of a location, it's not just a, dis a, a, a circle, it's not just a bounding box, it's not really just a polygon because that thing just keeps on moving around the whole time. And we also found as well that you know, what we first thought is, well, let's produce all these isochrone shapes. You know, we, could, we could get that to be really fast, and we can produce those and send them over an API. Um, but then we sort of realized that polygons weren't really enough. Because if I give you two lists, and I say, this one is everything within 10 miles, and this one is everything within one hour, the emphasis is still on you to figure out which one is most meaningful for you. And when it comes to relevancy, all you're really doing is essentially saying, you know, I've got another piece of data that says this is within an hour and this one's within 10 miles. It puts, again, too much emphasis back on, back on the user. And when we got to the multi-polygon searching, you know, we could reduce the complexity down of those polygons, but then you're reducing the accuracy. So what's the point? You know, you're taking a very highly accurate way of searching the world around you and then degrading that to achieve that performance criteria that I was talking about earlier on in terms of how, those conver how performance impacts those conversions. And yeah, we could simplify them, but what on earth would be the, the, the point in, in that? And I know, because we, we've tried it. <laughs> um, so we had to come to this conclusion, this idea that we needed an API that could do this. Um, and it seems so simple, but you've got a request and a response. And the request takes into account um, an origin or a destination. That could be an individual, it could be a business, it could be an event, such as today. And we can send it lots and lots of locations that are relevant for that search. Maybe it's a property search, maybe it's a classified search, maybe it's a hotel search, whatever you're searching for. Maybe it's a delivery search. And then very, very, very quickly, we need to then have a response that gives the travel times um, to each of those locations um, based on mode of transport, time of day, all of the things that you can imagine impact that sort of search. And we went through sort of many different iterations of this. None of them as pretty as this, but we did need to move away from the idea that what we weren't doing was taking a list of results that have been optimized by distance or bounding box or a polygon, and then resorting those by time. So if you imagine you know, you're querying your database, you get your pagination results out, and then each page, if you're just assigning a travel time to each of those results, it's more useful, but all you're really doing is you know, many A to B routes on a front end view to make sure that user doesn't have to jump out to another application to understand the results that they're being displayed. So we needed to get to a point where you know, we could rank and sort millions of locations in milliseconds over an API in real time. Um, and we did it. Um, and it, it looks simple, um, but I'm only 21. I mean, I've aged, I've aged enormously through this, through this process, but this is our Elasticsearch plugin, and either you can query your entire index by your travel time uh, and your, your, your travel time limits, but then also you can do your, your pre-filtering, and in here we're doing a property-based search, so you could actually go into the core of the index that you've already got, and now you're actually taking all of the results inside of there that are relevant to the individual, to the user or the business, that completely reflects the physical world in which they find themselves in. And we are an API. We're, we're not a whole solution. You wouldn't come to us. We haven't got our own version of Elastic or OpenSearch or Solar or Lucene or whatever. You know, we, we're a series of APIs. We've done integrations into various different um, databases and applications, um, but it's not the whole solution. We leave that to the sort of creativity of our customers, whether that's in modeling, so building models that reflect the physical world, ready for query time. You know, some, some companies aren't very uh, happy to begin um, using our API in the runtime of, or the query time of all of their applications. So we can actually help them model the existing data they've already got. But for many of our customers, we do in real time actually um, integrate with their databases to make sure that they are querying um, their data in a much more relevant way.
relevant way. And it looks something like this. So this is one of our customers' total jobs in the UK, part of Stepstone Group, part of Axel Springer Group. They've done this launch across the whole of Europe now, but essentially what you're seeing here is that you can locate yourself, um, you can set a, mode, a, a time, and then you can search. And here you, here you can see all of the results coming back. They've all got a travel time associated with them. Um, and you can see that it's not sorted by time. It's not just saying, okay, the best job for you is the one that's two minutes down the road, because location is really only part of the ability to you know, make the most relevant result that is meaningful for the individual, for the user, but also for the, the company, the business, the organization that is powering and operating that, that site. And what we found at uh, Stepstone is that they increased the relevancy of their search and their conversions by, by 10%. Um, it was actually Stepstone that challenged us to have the search as, uh, to be able to be queried in runtime because what they didn't want to have to do is you know, ref copy all of our data into their servers and have that running. They wanted to shift all of that, um, uh, that responsibility to us. Um, and it was, it was a really, uh, really great moment for us. And then uh, uh, some frustration uh, arose in the fact of uh, your friend of mine, COVID. Uh, and then we were suddenly you know, a, a search business um, specializing in how we were all using the physical world around us. Uh, and everyone was staying at home. Um, which was great because you know we had this very fast performant database search. Um, everyone's staying at home. Uh, what what did that do? Well, we we actually found almost immediately um, problems in the UK around COVID nineteen and the access of, of tests. So in the UK, you were able to go and get a free PCR test at any point um, if you were symptomatic. And they launched this application very, very quickly, and they did what anyone else would do, use the existing databases, and then just default searches the distance. And immediately, the press picked up on this and, and found that people were being you know, shown tests that were 500 miles away. We had tests from Liverpool. So this is Liverpool. Liverpool's got um, the River Mersey running through it, where people were being shown you know, results either side of the river that they couldn't actually access very easily. And even um, results um, searching from Liverpool and picking up results in Belfast or the Isle of Man, because those databases were just reflecting um, a distance-based search. They, they didn't know the, the database didn't know there was a C in the way. They didn't know how you would actually get from Liverpool to Be uh, to to Belfast. Um, so we ended up in real time. Um, if any of you are from the UK and you had the misfortune of having to go and do a PCR test, um, it was our technology that was matching in real time the location that you were being sent to uh, in order to go and get the right test at the right time. And what we found is that it led to a much more balanced test across the UK with higher access uh, and completion. So we were able to actually sort of normalize those peaks out. So instead of, you know, the, we, they were able to obviously understand the real-time availability and then suggest locations where someone could get to to do a test where the, where the capacity was higher than potentially somewhere, somewhere else. Now, I am no machine learning model expert, uh, and I do not pretend to be um, either. But there is a, a customer of ours who I cannot yet name, but a uh, very large recruitment firm in the, in the US, who is using our technology to essentially find commonality between the locations and jobs and services that they, that they provide and that they run at query time. So they do this enormous amount of searching on our platform um, about every, every other week. They rebuild their model, and then that model sits in a place where they can then query that um, on, on their side. And for us as a piece of technology, we don't, we don't, really, we don't really care. We, 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 we love being involved in the query time at runtime because you know, I'm a performance junkie. I want to see things running really, really quickly in real time. But for queries like this, where there's potentially you know, billions, of, billions of results, um, they actually take our data and reuse that inside of their models. Um, and because it is, again, so performant and so fast, um, 
and very, very, very concurrent. Um, this is something they can do um, very, very easily. And they also in, it saw this sort of increase in conversion, both for the searcher and the recruit and the recruiters as well. And we've we, we've sort of got involved in in lots of other things as well. Um, in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same in in other other locations. But if a teacher or a a lecturer or a professor was to call in sick, uh, there's then the ability to actually try and find someone who can get to those get to that. Um, that classroom uh, within a within a reasonable time, um, as well as actually predicting the fare cost of that as well. So, if you're looking at shift work, we can then actually understand how much it's going to do, how much it's going to cost for someone to move around. So you can actually take in the whole the whole cost of their of their of their search, and this is reflected in uh, Side.co uh, in France that do shift work. So this is sort of incredibly complex searching where you're searching. Uh, during various different times of day from various different locations simultaneously and then actually building up the most relevant shift um, pattern for someone to make sure one that all the shifts are, are full but then on the other side that all of the people looking for work are also em employed and have um, have availability and the flexibility of an API um, means that we have to stop ourselves developing those end-to-end -end solutions you know we we have to exist. We, have, uh, uh, we always have to design things in the ability that they will be consumed by a user, but we don't actually ever get to speak to them or talk to them in the sense of you know connecting to them virtually. Um, and again, it's it's COVID related um, mainly because well you were all here during the past two years um, that you know the the New York Times did a piece on actually at the peak of COVID trying to understand how far everyone in the US was from an emergency room. And then trying to actually understand where areas of deprivation were, were sorry, to then see how unfair some of the access to healthcare services are. Now, this is a piece of analysis that sits there. It's, you know, it, was, it was done in isolation. But when you actually put that into the real world and looking about healthcare and how people can access and use services around them in a fair way, um, again, um, there's sort of a, a limitless sort of idea around it. But as you can see, we called our company Travel Time, right? So we're, we're a bit biased. We're super focused on, on the ability to search by time. We believe it's a really relevant way of searching, but it's not always the best thing to, do, to use. And it's, it's important to, to remember that. I think it's, you know, there's definitely, when search areas are really small, you know, if you're saying that there's, you know, something's 0.1 miles away, I mean, I get it, right? It's close. I don't need to know it's less than a minute uh, away from away from where I am. And distance can be good enough. You know, there is the, there is, just by actually understanding locations, having them geocoded correctly, having them searched correctly, can be more than good enough. Um, and that when there's not enough locations, so let's say, for example, I'm trying to post a parcel, uh, and there's only three locations that I can actually uh, get to, well, I can usually eyeball those, especially if they're in a local area that I really understand. So there are sort of various areas where it is super powerful and various areas where it isn't. And the other one as well is that we have to have, in our systems, a hugely accurate supply of transport data to make sure that when we're doing these searches, they truly reflect the world around us. They're not just a circle, um, which we've applied a speed equals distance over time calculation to. Um, tried that, uh, it doesn't actually work very well. Um, and location, if it's not part of the decision-making process, then time and the travel time isn't really an important metric to use at all. Um, we are most valuable when there is lots and lots and lots of different options, whether that's property, jobs, hotels, ads, whatever it may be, when we're trying to make sure that those locations are much more relevantly displayed, um, that's where um, our API and the relevancy of it can become important. But it's also very important to not forget about um, other ways of searching location data as well. I think I'm running out of time, maybe. But there's, there's two other things that we found really recently that have been really um, important. Now, I didn't take this photo, and it's about 50 pence out. Uh, in the UK at the moment, we've now hit 100 pounds uh, to fill up the averaged family-sized car um, with fuel. 
And we're obviously seeing huge impacts of energy costs across the globe for obvious terrible, terrible reasons that are unfolding in front of us. What we have seen, though, is that the searches happening on our platform have led more to some sustainable options. Because if you're an application or site that is requiring people to move around, if you're actually understanding the physical world they have to move around in, you can actually offer them more sustainable um, and perhaps even cheaper options for them to go and achieve the thing that they're trying to do. Because when it comes down to search, and I'm in a room full of people that work in search, but search is about trying to find something. It's having an intent to then actually find the thing for retrieval or first idea. And to make sure that someone can get there efficiently um, is super, super important. So I go back to the very first question that was on the very first slide almost, uh, I think, 71 slides ago. That's how many we've done. We've done it. Um, should we stop using location, uh, sorry, distance in our location-based recommendation models? Um, no, it does have a really good purpose. Um, but in certain situations, the physical world uh, can be an incredibly valuable way um, of searching. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today. I really greatly appreciate it. It's been wonderful to be here today with uh, Berlin Buzzwords and you all. So yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you, Charlie, for the great presentation. Anyone has question? Um, so, when you mentioned um, um, real time in milliseconds on large data sets, yeah. um, how does it work? I mean, um, you obviously you also have to take into consideration the user. Uh, he might be on bike, by foot, uh, yeah. or, or, or by car. So, the calculation of the time. Uh, function of distance is, is dependent on the user that makes the query. Yeah. So how, how does it work that fast? Um, you, you, you're right. You have to be, you can't cheat this problem, right? You, you can't have a big lookup table that is, for example, every zip code to zip code and just produce the result coming back as a, as a way of doing this calculation really quickly. At the core of what we have is an ability to search um, hundreds of thousands of routes simultaneously incredibly quickly. So at, at peak of what we do, you know, we can turn around 100,000 locations in under 100 milliseconds. And that includes the network time. So if you're running um, any of our SDKs or, or plugins into Elastic or Solar, you can run those queries. <clears throat> you send over. Um, network all of the locations that would be relevant for that search. So, for example, if it's a property search, everything that was three, you know, three bedrooms or, 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 or lower, or whatever the criteria was for that search, and then in real time we turn back those results fast enough that there isn't a performance drop off for the for the user. And that's the thing that we've cracked. That that's the ability to do it very very quickly at very high performance at huge scale. Because you're right, if, if, if you do that and it doesn't take into account what they can really do, and you're just cheating by using a circle and speed distance over time or whatever, the results, you might put the unit of time on them, but they won't actually be relevant or accurate to the individual. So every search that comes into our platform um, takes into account exactly the front door or the true lat long of where that individual business is, and then searches either from them or back to them. So, yeah, it's... Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. So we have time. Hi, f thanks for the talk. It was very Pleasure. interesting. Uh, I was wondering whether, uh, so, or uh, what is the main use case for such an such an API? Whether this is about uh, or more about. Um, short distances or relatively short distances like uh, reachable with one, uh, within one hour or so? Um, or um, does it also work well with like long distances uh, including uh, hundreds and thousands or th uh, thousands of uh, kilometers? So uh, obviously, uh, just, just to um, uh, complement, obviously yeah. the amount of results also uh, rises. Yeah, so we, 
let me try and get this completely right. We we do we don't do any intercontinental search, but we do um, cross country searching, um, and that can scale up to sort of as many hours as the use case is for 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 that search. Um, and then the sort of use cases around those, we don't at the moment do air travel. Um, air travel in some ways would be somewhat more simplistic because you hope that a plane only has two sort of variables, <laughs> when it takes off and, and when it lands, and then you hope nothing happens sort of in, in between that. Um, but we do do sort of, you know, searches from airports or to airports. So for example, you know, if you're trying to optimize a hotel to stay in for this conference, you might already know that you need to be in Berlin, and there's only a, a certain number of you know, airports you can fly in to do that. But when you're on the ground, trying to understand the availability and price of a hotel to make sure you can actually get to this conference for 10 a.m. or 9.30 a.m., whenever it may be, um, would be sort of where the API would be, would be used. But we have done and will do much larger scale searches. But right now, you couldn't say, I'm in London, you know, the, the first map I showed, that, that isochrome within sort of 40 days, uh, we, we don't have that ability yet. Yeah. Uh, sorry, we don't have time for other questions. Maybe you can address them yeah, afterwards. I'll just be right here. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe so down there. <laughs> let's give a last round of applause Great. to Carolyn. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.